Presbyterian. My name is Ian Carton. I'm the minister here. I hope you're keeping well. I hope you're staying safe and uh, not going out any more than you ought to be. And, uh, and I hope that uh, for many of you, uh, you've already had your, uh, your vaccination jab. And for the rest of you, I hope you're waiting patiently uh, for that opportunity and uh, looking forward to, to, to the blessing of uh, taking another step towards normal. But in the meantime, it is good to be able to gather in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, our Saviour and our Redeemer, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's a, a wonderful treasure, a wonderful privilege that we've been given and a wonderful opportunity that we have uh, thanks to, to all this uh, technology and thanks to the grace and mercy of the living God that we can gather in his name. We're going to be led into our worship now as the uh, as the choir sing for us um, our wonderful intro this morning. Behold him. Thank you, choir.
and Eve. So we'll look at a Bible story, craft, have a special challenge from some special friends, a prayer and then finish with a final thought. So grab your drink and a biscuit and let's do this. When you're stuck at home with time to spare, can't go outside, you're not going anywhere. Why don't you pull up a chair or pull up a suit Tune into Virtual Sunday School We're the craft to do and a story or two Say hello to Nat, she's stuck at home too Why not tune in to Virtual Sunday School? The story of Adam and Eve can be found in Genesis chapters 2 and 3 To help us tell today's story, I've got these two little dudes Adam and Eve! Guess she's a little dudette. So, God created Adam and placed him in the Garden of Eden to look after it. Boosh! A beautiful garden with trees and rivers running through it. I feel like our poorly maintained garden in the middle of winter isn't the best representation of the Garden of Eden. But... And in the middle of the garden was the tree of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, you are free to eat from any of the trees in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat of that tree, then you will surely die. Now God had a job for Adam, naming all the animals. So that's what he did. Now as much as Adam loved all these cool new animals, none of them were really a suitable partner for him to share his life with. The dog came pretty close but wasn't quite good enough. So the Lord caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep and he took out one of Adam's ribs and God made woman from the rib. And she turned out to be a pretty good partner for Adam. Dream team. Now in the garden, there was a serpent, the craftiest of all the wild animals. Ooh, so sneaky. The serpent said to the woman, God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman replied, 
we can eat from any of the trees in the garden, except the tree right in the middle. We must not touch it or we will die. You won't die, the serpent said. God knows that if you eat of this tree, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw the fruit and saw that it looked pretty tasty and becoming like God. Well, that was awfully tempting. So she took some fruit and she ate it. And she gave some to Adam and he saw that it looked pretty tasty and it was awfully tempting. So he ate it too. And when they had eaten it, their eyes were opened and they suddenly realized they weren't wearing any clothes. They were naked. So they quickly sewed some fig leaves together to cover themselves up. Next, they heard God walking in the garden and they were ashamed. So they hid themselves. God asked, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? Adam replied and tried to pin it all on Eve. She gave me the fruit and Eve then blamed the snake. He deceived me. Everything had been happy as Larry. But now, because they didn't do what they were told, they were having this big awkward blame party. And because they had disobeyed God, there were consequences. They were banished from the Garden of Eden and angels were placed on the entrance to keep them out. And so Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Oh, and then Adam named the woman Eve because she would be the mother of all living. Apparently Adam just forgot to give her a name this whole time. As if! Anyway, this story tells us where sin comes from. Everything was perfect in the Garden of Eden until the serpent tempted Eve, which led to Adam and Eve eating from the one tree in the garden that God had told them not to. They were disobedient to God and made a silly bad choice. The Bible calls this sin. And it's because of sin that we live in what we call a fallen world. In fact, sometimes people refer to the story of Adam and Eve as the fall. The world that we live in isn't perfect and we are all sinners. Fortunately, we have a very forgiving God and through Jesus' death and resurrection, we can have a restored relationship with him. However, until we join Jesus in heaven, we still live in a fallen world and we still have to deal with things like temptation and sin. So, in today's story, Adam and Eve fell victim to temptation. <laughs> And it is something we all encounter from time to time. So for today's VSS, we thought we'd play a fun little game with a couple of special guests. Let's head over to Ollie and Theo as we play a fun little game about temptation. Right. You're going to stand there, all right? You're going to look at the apple, but you're not allowed to touch it, OK? Where you going? I'm going to go out of the room, all right, and then I'll come back in a minute. OK, you have the apple when I come back. What are you doing? Right, you stand there, look at the apple, but don't touch it. Okay? Yeah? You didn't touch it? No, no. Good boy. Good boy, would you like to bite it? Go on then, bite it. Bite that apple, good boy. High five. Yeah. Theo, you little legend. Ah, oh, look at that, some good parenting from Ollie. Yeah, he's gonna put me to shame. I always remember I had a friend who said, temptation is a beast. Maybe a bit like that wily snake in the Garden of Eden. Well, let's remember to keep asking God to help us overcome it. Crap time! Woo woo! Crap time! Woo woo! Today, we're going to create the serpent that tempted Eve. 
To do this, you will need a pipe cleaner or some string, some pasta, some googly eyes or pens, and if you want, some paint. Firstly, you'll need to bend your pipe cleaner at one end or tie a knot in it. This is going to be the spine of the snake to put all the bits of pasta on. Next, start putting your pasta onto the pipe cleaner or piece of string. When you get to the end, you might want to use a different shaped piece of pasta for the head. Then you can add your googly eyes to the head or you could draw some on. And you've got yourself a pasta snake! And if you're feeling arty, you could even get the paints out and decorate it all sorts of colours and patterns. For today's prayers, let's thank God that even though we live in a fallen world, we can still have God's forgiveness thanks to Jesus' death and resurrection. And let's ask him to help us fight temptation when it comes our way. Dear Lord, when I face temptation, please help me to overcome it. Thank you that even when I do fail, you are ready with forgiveness and love to pick me back up again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so, a final thought. The serpent tempted Eve, which led to both Adam and Eve eating from the one tree that God had told them not to eat from. And this is where sin came into the world. Just like Eve was tempted, we can face all sorts of temptations in our lives as well. We need to keep our eyes focused on God so that we don't give in to those temptations. And remember, thanks to Jesus' death and resurrection, we can have forgiveness and a relationship with God. Last week, we played the blindfold drawing challenge. Let's see how you got on. Last week's blindfold drawing challenge was quite challenging. Yeah, you guys have taken up that challenge and produced some drawings of your own. <laughs> and have a look at them. Look, they're amazing. Well done, everyone. It was not an easy thing to draw without being able to see. So some of these results are amazing. If I want two of them, I'm like, they're really good. Are you sure you weren't peeking? But, you know, that's fine. I'll take your word for it. You've done a brilliant job. And there's an interesting array of different blindfolds as well. We've got scarves and masks and blindfolds of all sorts and colours and shapes and sizes, which is great fun to see as well. Uh, oh, and look, even Dad's getting involved. Well done on this one, guys. It has been a really fun one. A well done for all these drawings. Yeah. This week, we want to see your pasta snakes. Just to clarify, we mean your snake that you've made out of pasta, not your pasta dressed up as a snake. Although, if you want to do that, then send us a photo because it will be funny. <laughs> Ask your grown-up to head over to our Virtual Sunday School UK Facebook page or Instagram account and send us a photo. Before we finish, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. See you next week! Why not tune in to Virtual Sunday School? Samson, look at me.
Let's continue in worship as we join together now in prayer. Let's pray. In Psalm 23, we read these familiar words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his own name's sake. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the one who has promised never to leave us or abandon us. You are utterly faithful, whether we are living in times of sorrow or whether we are living uh, through times of joy, whether we are on the mountaintop or the deepest valley. You lead and sustain us. We praise you, for you are our shepherd God. We pray for those today, Lord, who face the greatest challenges in the midst of these worrying days. We pray for those with, with underlying health issues who are simply deeply afraid. We pray for those whose health is weak and for the elderly. We pray for those with disabilities. We pray for, for children with special needs and their parents and carers. We pray for the lonely and the fearful. Lord, we ask that you would make your presence so very tangible, so very real for those folk. That you would give them uh, your strength. That you would uh, restore to them their hope. That you would uh, pour over them the great blessing of peace so that they will not be swept away with fear and worry, but instead they will stand secure in the knowledge that you hold them in your arms. Thank you, Lord, that you are our shepherd. Well, we thank you again um, this time, Lord. We thank you for all the, the emergency services who are continuing to play such an important role. Lord, it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable to hear on the news day and daily of the, the lengths that they're going to, how difficult it is for them to have any kind of rest, and just the sheer stress uh, and the burden that has been laid upon them. Lord, we pray that you would give them the strength to continue to care, not merely to, to, uh, to act according to, to their professional standards, although we do ask for that, Lord. But more than that, we ask that they, that you would give them the power, the grace, the mercy to show continuing compassion to the patients in their care. We pray, Lord, that for all those who, who may be risking their, their very own health in order to keep the rest of us safe, we pray for those who feel overwhelmed and exhausted by demands placed on them. Lord, give them encouragement and energy and wisdom. And Lord, we pray for one another. We pray, Lord, that you would sustain us, encourage us, remind us of your unfailing, unflagging promises. Remind us that you never leave us or abandon us and that you promise to be with us always. So, Lord, give us hope. Give us hope because, ultimately, we who believe in Jesus Christ, we know our hope is secure. And you will, you will be with us to the end of this life and on into eternity, fulfilling the promises that you've made, that there is a, a wonderful place for us. And for us, Lord, death has no fear. But Lord, you've promised us life and life to the full. So Lord, glorify your name here with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn now and hear from God's word. And then we're going to spend a little while just reflecting on, uh, on, the, on the mercy and grace of God. Uh, we're going to read from Hebrews today, Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm going to read from, uh, from verse 6 
of that chapter. I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's message translation. I think it gives a real uh, vitality to this passage. So uh, please do listen along. But Jesus' priestly work far surpasses what these other priests do, since he's working from a far better plan. If the first plan, the old covenant, had worked out, a second wouldn't have been needed. But we knew the first one was found wanting, because God said, Heads up, the days are coming when I'll set up a new plan for dealing with Israel and Judah. I'll throw out the old plan I set up with their ancestors when I led them by the hand out of Egypt. They didn't keep their part of the bargain, so I looked away and let it go. This new plan I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper, isn't going to be chiselled on stones. This time I'm writing out a plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. They won't go to school to learn about me or, or buy a book called God in Five Easy Lessons. They'll all get to know me firsthand for themselves. The little and the big, the small and the great, they'll get to know me by being kindly forgiven, with the slate of their sins forever wiped clean. By coming up with a new plan, a new covenant between God and his people. God put the old plan on the shelf and there it stays, just gathering dust. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us this morning. I want to talk about that new plan today. I want to talk about that uh, that incredible generosity of the living God, his, uh, his, um, his determination that nothing should come between us and him, that he would go the extra mile in order to, to win us, in order to bring us into his embrace. I was reading a book by a gentleman called Andrew Farley. It's called God Without Religion. Can it really be true? Well, I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. He takes us back in the course of his book to, uh, to a story of, of, a, of a wedding, a story of a marriage, a marriage between uh, David and Shelley. By the time they came to speak to uh, Mr. Farley, they had uh, been married for nine years. For the first few years, all had gone very well, but uh, David didn't realise that Shelley had some plans for him, plans to change him. In fact, plans to change him or else. She really liked him, but there were some things in it and she, she, she planned to, you know, work on them. If she could change him, she'd stick with him, but if he didn't change... Well, that would leave the door open and, uh, and that would be her, uh, her opportunity to walk out. Maybe David was a bit naive whenever he entered this marriage. He assumed that Shelley was in it for life. <clears throat> An understandable assumption. That was, after all, what she promised. But they weren't married more than a couple of years before Shelley began to complain, began to complain that uh, he was lazy. Uh, his low paying job didn't bring in as much money as she wanted. Um, she would compare him uh, unfavorably to, to his uh, successful brother. She would say, why couldn't you be like, I don't have his name, but let's call him Jim. Why couldn't you be like Jim? He's got a plan, he's got a future, he knows what he's doing. Why can't you be like more, more like him? You can't stay in the same dead-end job forever. That's not going to get us out of this hole. And David, well, David began to feel a lot of the heavy weight of, of that responsibility. To be honest, David was really doing everything he could. He actually uh, had two jobs. 
Um, during during the week he was in, involved in construction and then at the weekend he had another job in car sales. He was doing everything he could but it just never seemed to be enough. Her standards, her expectations, her contract, as far as she was concerned, he was reneging on the contract. He just wasn't doing what she thought he should be doing. And eventually Shelley decided that if he couldn't be what she wanted him to be, then she was leaving. David was heartbroken. Heartbroken because he was absolutely in love. He wanted to do nothing more than, than please her. He just couldn't. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't keep her happy. And eventually, Shelley went and spoke to her lawyers and got the papers and uh, began the process for a divorce. Doesn't sound like a great marriage, sure it doesn't. Doesn't sound like uh, like one rooted in the in the idea of a coming together of equals, sure it doesn't. I wonder if if you if if uh, if you knew that was going to happen in a marriage you were getting involved in, maybe you'd think twice. A marriage so bound up in in uh, in false expectations in. Uh, Oh, in, in dreams that could never be fulfilled, in, in kind of a, a rule book that you could never see and rules you could never, you could never um, completely obey. But that is what a lot of us do fear in terms of our relationship with God. You know how the Bible describes our relationship with God as, as being like a marriage relationship. A relationship that is, uh, that is formed as part of a covenant. We talk about the, the, the covenant of marriage. But maybe a lot of us have a, have a wrong-headed view of what our relationship with God is really like. We haven't realised the full the full breadth, the full depth of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because it's like we're living under the old covenant, under the old contract, the old rule. The rule of, of law. The rule that the, the, uh, um, the, the house of Israel over all those years that we read about in the Old Testament consistently failed. Even Paul talks about his own failure, even, even in, as someone who tried really hard to keep all the rules. He would constantly find himself tripping up and failing. And so the writer to the Hebrews takes this, in this little passage, takes the opportunity to emphasise how dramatically different the kind of relationship that Jesus Christ has made possible is from that rule-bound relationship. Look again at that, at that passage that I read out. I'll throw out the old plan I set up with their ancestors. When I led them by the hand out of Egypt, they didn't keep their part of the bargain, so I looked away and let it go. But this new plan I'm making with Israel isn't going to be written on paper, isn't going to be chiselled on stone. This time I'm writing out the plan in them, carving it on the lining of their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Such amazing, wonderful, grace-filled words. Jesus came to change the dynamic so that we would no longer be, be scraping around desperately frustrated and, and worried about, about, um, about doing something that's impossible for us to do. Right at the core, right at the very heart 
of forming this relationship with God is the whole idea of forgiveness. So in this new contract that we have through Christ, the problem of, of, uh, um, of desperate, rigorous obedience, soulless and dry, is absolutely wiped away. And instead, we are, we are given a place at the table. We don't have to prove or justify our, our reason for being there. We don't have to show our, our credits. We don't have to show our, our, uh, our exam scores. We don't have to show our, our job appraisals. Uh, we don't have to, to, have to show a, a personality profile. Um, we simply receive what Jesus Christ has given us because he has given us a place at the table, a part in the family of God. God's great new plan is that we get to know him firsthand, that the, the great vast gulf of distance between God and humanity between the eternal God and, and each one of us has been bridged. They'll all get to know me firsthand, is how Peterson translates it. Oops. <laughs> Oops. They'll all get to know me firsthand by being forgiven, the slate of their sins being completely wiped and wipe forever, a brand new heart given to us. Everyone under the old way failed, not just some, not just a few failures, not just the really bad and incompetent ones, but everyone failed to keep that kind of law. So everyone needs grace, everyone needs what Jesus Christ has to give. There is nothing other than Christ we can we can show to God and say, look at this, aren't you really impressed? Because he's God. Nothing's good to impress him that way. But show him Jesus. Show him that that Jesus loved you, loves you. Show him that you know him because he lives in you. And there is a place for you. God has thrown out that old plan. It wasn't working. Performance-based faith was a non-starter. Performance-based salvation was a non-starter. Grace-based salvation is God's great new plan. What a different kind of marriage that is. To know that you are loved as you are. To know that while your, your, your partner wants the very best for you, their love for you is not conditional on you uh, ticking some of their boxes. Their love for you is, is rooted in, in, in who they are. The, the secret to this, this promise of God is it's not about us. It's actually about God's faithfulness to himself. God has, has, has promised that uh, he's promised to himself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 verses 18 and 19. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us 
can be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So let me encourage you today. Do not be downhearted. Do not feel that you are that you are letting God down. God's relationship with you is generous beyond words. His love for you is unending and unfailing. And he has kept a place for you. And all he asks for you is that you would receive what he's given in and through the glorious love of Jesus Christ. So maybe today, maybe today is your day to meet with the lover of your soul and accept that you can be loved by the almighty King of Kings and Lord of Lords and you can be welcomed home. Amen. We're going to bring our service to a close now. And we're going to stand, or as usual, you can sit uh, and, and sing uh, with our closing praise. So let's worship God together.
Well, once again, thank you for being with us here for worship in Whitehead Presbyterian. I'm delighted that you've been able to join us. I hope you'll stay safe through this week and uh, keep well and take the, the vaccination if it's offered to you. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you again next week here, um, either on YouTube or Facebook, um, or you can listen to us and uh, the phone number will be available on the Facebook page. Let's bring our service to a close now as we share together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and forever. Amen. Amen and Amen. <laughs>